this morning. Somebody said that they who do not learn the mistakes and lessons of history are condemned to repeat them. If you don't know, if you know what happened in history, you're going to make the same mistake people made in history. And that's, I hated history in school. I hated history with a passion. And I guess the reason the devil wanted me to hate history so bad, because if I'd have knew it, I'd have knew where, what this country was founded upon, and I'd know it wasn't the big six flag playland glory bowl they try to make it into this day and time, a fantasy world that does not exist. I will see something here in Deuteronomy. I've always believed for years that Israel coming out of the bondage of Egypt and and uh, God bringing them out and taking them into the promised land is a type of God blessing America. I believe you'll see a lot of types in the story of Israel that you see God bringing the pilgrims to America and giving them this land. I'm not saying America is in the scripture. I know preachers try to push America into the scripture. And to be honest with you, I don't know if it is or not. I've never seen it. But I do believe in type the story of Israel, especially in Deuteronomy 28, is a picture of America. You can't read Deuteronomy 28 hard without thinking of America. Look at Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, America, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And that's exactly where he put our blessed country that we live in, high of all nations. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if... Now, we don't have any talking, maybe just as quiet as possible while I read the scripture, please. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, your kids, and the fruit of thy ground, your crops, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way, and flee before thee seven ways. Verse 9, The Lord shall establish thee a few people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. You know, people in other countries, some of them still think America is a Christian nation. Matter of fact, some people in other countries think everybody in America is a Christian. And they're afraid of America. Too bad it's not true. But I want you to notice what the Lord said to him over there in verse 15. In verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, your kids, and the fruit of thy land, your crops, and the increase of thy kind, that's your cattle and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke. And, and he said here that they would send for to do until thou be destroyed, until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. 
The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he has consumed thee from off of the land. Notice what he said there in verse number 32. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto other people, and thine eyes shall look and fall with longing for them all the day long. And there shall be no might in thy hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall nation which thou knowest not eat up. And thou shalt only be, a, be oppressed and crushed away, so that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. Verse 38, or look at verse 37. And thou shalt become astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and shalt gather but little in, for the locust shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine nor drink, gather of the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. And on and on and on we could go about how God said, America, you just have it, whichever way you want to have it. If you do right and serve me, I'll bless you beyond description. But if you rebel and turn against me, then we'll let the locusts eat your crop, crops, and Russia will eat your, your, your rice, and, and your, uh, use your crops and your potatoes, and your onions, and your pears, your cucumbers, your fruits and vegetables, then strangers are going to eat it. And God said, I tell you, brother, he, when God blessed this nation to begin with, the Lord said, I put before you a blessing or a curse. Now, where America messed up was she got too big for her britches and began to think God was obligated to stand by her and guide her through the night with a light from above. I want to tell you something this morning. God Almighty is obligated to no man or no nation on the face of this earth. If we do right and please God, He'll bless us. If we do wrong and sin against God, His curse will come upon us. I want to bring you just a brief message this morning to the point, and you listen very carefully, on the subject, why the American dream will become the American nightmare. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence this morning, we're conscious of the fact that we don't deserve it outside of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we're not holy except for your holiness. We're not righteous except for your righteousness. We're not perfect or pure except for your pureness and perfectness. Oh, God, this morning we're glad that we are covered by the precious blood. Lord, we thank you for the Bible, that it doesn't leave us in darkness. We thank you that we know the nation come from, where it's at, and where it's going. Our Father, this morning we pray that you'd use these lips of clay, anoint us with that special touch, and maybe, God, you'd give us a little reviving in our bondage. And maybe, God, you may speak to some heart. Maybe some man, some woman, boy or girl, who is not saved, speak to them this morning. And we'll praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray and for Jesus' sake. Amen. You know, a lot of people talking these days about living a dream. And dreaming a nightmare. I'm convinced that this morning that if things don't change in America and America don't turn back to God, the American dream will become the American nightmare. You know what the American dream is? The American dream is that you can grow up and marry who you want to and get a job and make a living for yourself and leave something for your children for them to be happy and prosperous and live in a free land. It's coming home to mama making apple pies in the oven and the kids playing baseball in the yard. It's a big black book on the kitchen table that they open up and read from and held hands and our family at the table before they ate the meals. The American dream was based and built and founded upon people who wanted that kind of a life. I'm convinced this morning, you know why a lot of kids are killing themselves and on drugs and overdosing and blowing their brains out? Because they can see the American dream has not very much of a chance in the day that you and I are living in. What 
opportunity that these little kids up here and is in this choir house to go up and live the kind of life I was talking about a while ago if things continue as they are today in our land. What kind of a chance does some of these little young'uns have four and five years old who no longer see hands held around the family table, who no longer go big building on Sunday with a steeple on top of it, who no longer hear a preacher stand and proclaim the Word of God. I tell you, friends, the American dream can never be the American dream without honoring God and putting Him first. No nation on the face of this earth can prosper long when it forgets God. The Bible said in Psalm 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. I want to give you something that I've not ever done really and it's going to take uh, just, very, just a few minutes and I want to give it to you briefly. I want to give you a history of the United States of America. I'm going to tell you what's happened from the time this thing started. Now I'm going to start back here in the, in the 1600s when the, those 100 colony members met at Jamestown and founded the first American colony there in that locality. And then we're going to come up to here in the present, to where we are right now. And I'm going to bring you up to the present hour, 1985, and then we're going to do something that all Bible believers can do. We're going to pass 1985 and go on into the future a few years and give you even the future of America before it ever happens. In 1607, the Jamestown Colony was founded. Now, I'll give you these important dates. There are thousands of things that I could mention as we go, but if you're writing it down, in 1607, America's first colony was founded at Jamestown. Do you know what was going on in 1607? In 1604, the penman came from King James of England to translate the Word of God into the English language. They called out about 47 or 48 scholars, one of the most brilliant godly men on the face of the earth, and they were working on this blessed book that would today make this country what it is. Somebody said one time that America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she'll cease to be great. And that's why we're no longer a first-rate royal power in a lot of people's eyes anymore. That's why Russia can boss us around. That's why they can take our hostages and put them in jail and not be afraid to uh, blow them off the map. It's because America is no longer as great as she once was. I tell you, brother, there was a time in the history of this nation when another country would not dare take a hostage from the United States. They was afraid to. But I tell you, something has happened to this country. During the time this old book was being translated into the Word of God, I believe that God gave the King James Bible to the English-speaking world and the world of America on, and it is the final word and authority to the English-speaking world in the last day. I believe God had a right on schedule and right on time when he wanted the book to be translated and given to his people. And so in 1636, Harvard became our first college. Lord, help it so went a long way, ain't it? Now, Harvard, all of these first colleges that were built were built upon biblical principles. In 1647, Massachusetts just stabilized and established our first public school system. And the settlers were beginning to move out. And there's only 13 colonies there, you know, for a long time. And those settlers begin to branch out and they bought what they call the Louisiana Purchase a few years later, which doubled the size of the United States of America. And they begin to be educated. And they begin to drive back the, the red man. And I don't agree personally with the way the Indians were treated when Americans first came here, but the Indians, many of them were worshiping heathen gods, and God used America to bless the, the settlers and to punish the heathen idol worshippers for worshiping their God. The same way he used Israel to run out the Canaanites who worshiped false gods in the land of Canaan. And so in 1756, the stagecoach linked New York City and Philadelphia. And for the first time, you could travel from one city to another on a solid road. You know, I've been driving around up there in Tennessee. One time I was going, I was going to Knoxville or somewhere. I, uh, I'll be leaving, going over there. Chattanooga tomorrow to, to preach a youth camp all this week and I drive over them mountains over what tunnel caved in and man you go across through there and I thought a lot of times I thought what in the world would this place look like if 
there were no road and no signs and no lights. Lord help, I don't see how they done it. I don't see how no one ever figured out where they was. Daniel Boone, that crowd, going through, can you imagine? Can you imagine somebody dropping you on the top of Mount Mitchell and you didn't know where you was? You didn't know there wasn't no signs, there wasn't no roads, there wasn't no map, nothing but woods, brother, and bears and all kind of stuff like that, and rattlesnakes. I tell you, but our forefathers blazed the trail, amen? And I tell you, they pioneered those things, and in the 1700s, there's a lot of things went. Old Boston Tea Party was in 1773, where they dumped that big bunch of tea out there in the water. I bet that was a blessed sight. I tell you, brother, and a lot of things were going on. The total nature, the whole total population of the United States at this time was a little over 3 million. And in 1776, of course, our Declaration of Independence was signed, and we officially became a nation. 1776. And in 1787, our fathers wrote the Constitution of the United States. Now, I don't go so far as to a lot of, a lot of preachers go. Uh, some preachers, I mean, almost believe the Constitution is inspired of God. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but I do believe it's God-honored. And I do believe it. it was used by God. And I still believe it's the best form of any system on, on the face of this earth. You see, America came to, uh, uh, people came to America to live like this. We don't want the government running our lives. We don't want the government telling us how much land we can own, how many kids we can have, what we can do. We will be free to live our own lives and graze our crops. And though they still people got that American dream, but we're losing that today. We're losing that. If, uh, if the communists have their way, in a few years you won't be able to own so much land. You won't be able to have so many kids. They're out to destroy our land that the Lord gave us back in the early 1700s. But let me mention some uh, special events right quickly. In 1793, Eli Whitney began invented the cotton gin. 1814, Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Bank. And I tell you, brother, I love that old song that says, Oh, say. Right in the song called America, uh, and the Star Spangled Banner, Oh, say, does that Star Spangled Banner yet wave? Does it yet wave? Some of them would come back from the war. They didn't know they'd won or lost. And they'd come and say, Does the Spangled Banner still wave? And the answer would come back, Oh, glory, still flying in the wind. I tell you, brother, she had a lot of enemies. And the bloody stripes on that flag today represent the stripes and the blood our boys shed on the battlefield that make you and I free that we can live in this country. In, in 1825, the Erie Canal was opened. Progress began to take place. In 1834, the Reaper was invented. Now notice, in the 17 and 1800s, the greatest period of prosperity that the world has ever seen. The world has never Never seen a period of prosperity like 7, 1600, 1700, and 1800. The first 300 years after this book was written and came out, brother, the world prospered like ever had before. There were more inventions. That's what we call the Philadelphia Church Age in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. The Philadelphia Age, the age right before the worst stage. In 1901, as we'll get to in a few minutes, we moved into what they call the Lord of the Church Age, which is the last church church in the book of Revelation before the rapture of the church and that's why we see all the bad things happening that we see today. That's when the American Standard Version came out, by the way, in the early 1900s. And all the new modern versions of the Bible and all this type of thing. But we'll get to that in a moment. In 1837, Samuel Morse invented what they call the telegraph. You know, that's the way to, to send messages from one city to another. We got many, you know, there's several ways you can do it. Telegraph, telephone, telewoman. But anyway, you get, you get message from one city to another city. And so in 1848, somebody said, there's gold in California. And everybody said, I'm going to California and find me some gold. And in the, uh, what do you call them, fellas? The prospectors took the picks and the shovel. And everybody wanted to go back at rich. And some of them did strike it rich. But many did not. They found out that the love of money was the root of all evil. In 1860, they started the Pony Express. I tell you, I never did know too much about that Pony Express. Well, I heard Brother Jack Wood preach a sermon on it. Now, glory to God, that was a blessing, boy. Them old boys, you know what they remind me of? The preachers. Them old boys said, get the mail, and their job was deliver the mail. And them Pony Express boys, they'd pack it in those saddle bags, and they couldn't be overweight. 
They had to lay aside eight and the sin that would just easily beset them. And they'd get on them little old ponies like a little old uh, a jockey and beam them legs. Man, they'd take off across the country just to fly. And Indians could get them or, or robbers could get them and they would just zoom right down to the next city. Everybody would cheer them when they saw the Pony Express rider coming into town. I tell you, that challenges my soul. They didn't write the mail. They just delivered the mail. That's what I am this morning. I didn't write the Bible, son. I'm just God's mail, man. I'm going to tell you what God said in his mailbox and put it in your mailbox. You don't want to read it? It's your business. But I'm telling you, in 1860, that began to take place. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, thank God. Kinda. And brother, he invented the telephone. Sometimes there are and I tell you, brother, uh, he invented that thing up there. I went in the house up there in Canada where he invented that telephone. Uh, the United States and Canada both tries to claim it, but they say actually come up with it in that house across the line over in Canada. And they took us in it. We went up there and I was preaching to the Indians. And it was, it was a great invention. In 1877, Thomas Edison invented the phonograph. Lord, he didn't know what he was doing either. I told in 1879, and Thomas Edison invented light bulbs. All of these things happened after God began to bless America. And all the while these inventions were taking place, and all the while these things were being done, David Brainerd and men like him were carrying that book right there to the heathen and preaching the gospel. Preachers were going up and down the roads preaching the circuit riding preachers riding the, uh, the horses from one location to another preaching the Word of God. Let me tell you, hey kids, all you kids are in high school, don't you let some infidel tell you a professor in college or high school that this country is not founded upon the Bible and biblical principles. He's a liar. It is. You cannot separate the history of the United States from the Word of God and from the principles of God's Word. That's why we came here and that's why we're still here. God has prayed up in the wee hours in the morning, on the knees, praying that God would bless our country. Not only that, brother, let me tell you what some of our statesmen said during that time. Are you listening? John Adams made this statement. Are you listening? I wish we had those fellow humanists here this morning. I'd like to read them what John Adams said. He said, we have no form, no government armed with power, capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. He said, our form of government is not even made for people who are not religious and moral. And he said this, our Constitution was made only for a moral and a religious point. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Now, I need to put that in your humanistic pot and smoke it. The reprobates are telling us that First Amendment of our Constitution was to keep God in power and the Bible out of school by a bunch of dirty liars. That was not the intention of the Constitution of the United States. George Washington said, It is impossible to rock govern the world without God and the Bible. Andrew Jackson pointed at that book. And you know which book he's pointing at. That's right there. He pointed at that book one day and he said, That book, sir, is the rock on which our republic rests. Abraham Lincoln said, The Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. Woodrow Wilson said, The part of the destiny of America is how she pursues that great book. I think America was built on the founding of the Word of God. But we see other things begin to happen, and Americans begin to prosper. And one of the most dangerous things about prosperity is that it has a tendency to turn your heart away from the Lord. And so we see in 1903, the century changed. Here it was in the 1900s, the modern days. And the Wright brothers down there in North Carolina at Kitty Hawk got the first airplane off the ground. And they said it's a major step in the history of man. But just a years later when they learned to fly them things, in 1914, World War One broke out. And America, had, it was the first time the United States had fought a full-scale war on 
foreign soil. And we fought against Germany for four years. We were in a bloodbath with the Germans. And then it ended in 1918. And of course, America was victorious. After the war in 1918 came the, what they call the Roaring Twenties. And the prosperity in America like it had never been before. And people began to, they, by this time the automobile had been invented. And the horseless carriage. Up until that time, people rode around with uh, ca uh, chariots and horses and rode a horse. And all of a sudden, here's a guy coming down the road with a cat that ain't got no horse pulling it. And it runs off uh, fuel. And boy, I want you to know, a man could ride through Marion in a, a $60,000 Jaguar and it wouldn't turn his many eyes today in man as one of those automobiles running down a street in America uh, 60, 65, 70 years ago. And so they begin to, they begin to bebop around there and have both friends and girlfriends and have them a big time. And I want to tell you what happened in the roaring 20s. They got washing machines. They got modern invention. And people said, but we are on our way. But the sad thing about it was many people begin to leave God out of their life. Wasn't this church faithful in church as they were back in the old winters where they had to walk in three feet of snow to and shoot them a rabbit or a bear to live. Had, had food stuck, getting along pretty good. That's one of the most dangerous things about prosperity is you tend to forget God. That's what's wrong with our nation this morning. We have got so much. We've been blessed so much. We forgot about God. And we're in a mess sure enough. In 14, or 1920, the Lord Warren 20s came in. In 1925, radio came out and began to entertain. There was no television. There was just radio. And millions of people bought radios and listened to them old scary stories, you know. And the soap operas were on the radio back then. And you tune in every day to see if she's in still love with him and him the cowboys and who shot who and all that kind of stuff. And boy, the motion pictures come on the scene very, very soon. I, I, remember, I remember my daddy. Somebody tell me about the first television they ever seen. And somebody come running in and said, Boys, you've got to go down the street there. They were blankety blank radio down there you can see the picture on and boy they just couldn't get over it it was astounding to them how many of you grown ups here maybe grandmas and grandpa can remember growing up when there was no such thing as telling you never first never seen raise your hand or I don't you kids turn in there and look all over this house there are people who don't even know what it's like have one and you take a dying fit yours tears up in the pie man ain't done 30 minutes but I'm telling you that brother they the Roaring Twenties brought in a wave of prosperity and notice what happened. Theaters came to almost every town. They called them dream palaces in those days, and they were full of excitement and romance. And in the roaring 20s, women got out of the house and went and got jobs and began to pursue careers. And they said, we're tired of making biscuits and raising young We're going out to pursue us a career. And they said that this brought great problems as well as benefits. They called them the flaming youth. And women begin to wear new kind of clothes. They didn't wear. They begin to wear short skirts and roll down socks. And and instead of the long full dresses, and and they cut their hair off. And instead of wearing it like they did before, and they begin known as flappers. That's what they call. It. I don't know what a flapper is, but I've seen a lot of them at the mall the other night. And brother, they are flapping around there. And man, I tell you, they come out and and they cut their dresses off, and start wearing short skirts, and flap their hair. Off. Often, they say can't even cut it straight now. I seen one other night, and the spookiest looking. She looked like a, a lawnmower been on her head. <laughs> Honest. I mean, her was shaved over here on this side. Over here on this side, it was kind of shaved in there, and it was real long. And it started out real short back here at the back, and went like this. It was real long hanging down right here. <laughs> it looked like she had a weed on her head, man. I tell you what, brother, they begin to do that, and they became known as flappers. They rode around in their cars and went to nightclubs and drunk bootleg liquor, and brother gets to jazz music and dance to Charleston. And brother, things begin to get rough, and America began to get wicked. And during this time, those heroes came out. 
Strindberg, who threw the first attack across the Atlantic Ocean with nonstop across the ocean. I remember I read that story one time. I, man, I was excited. He was going, he was going in the face of unsurmountable odds. And man, the rain, the wind, the rain hitting him in the face. He had to stay up about three solid days. But he threw that plane across the ocean. Thank God for me and Pioneer Spirit. And they've done a lot of great things and made some accomplishments. Jack Dempsey and Babe Ruth were popular during these times. Everybody wanted to be Babe Ruth. Pow! Knock them home runs out of the ballpark. And it was take me out to the ball game and that type of thing. So what was going on with the church? Oh, there's an old boy by the name of Billy Sunday who was burning up the countryside. And he'd go into a town mother and he'd erect a big tabernacle. And he'd start, put up some uh, put up some posts and he'd erect a great big old tabernacle and Billy Sunday would fill it full of thousands of people and he'd get up and absolutely preach up a storm. You think I'm wild when I preach? Man, I couldn't hold a lot to them. And he was a Presbyterian. If Billy Sunday came into the average Presbyterian church in, in North Carolina this morning, preach, they'd throw him out on his, brother. He'd think they got uh, halfway up the aisle. Somebody said if Martin Luther come to the average Lutheran church nowadays, he'd think they got past a third ashtray. And somebody said if Billy uh, Sunday came back, they wouldn't know what to think about how far America has gone from God. But if he ran, he jumped, he busted chairs, he jumped over things, he preached the devil out of people. Yes. Nowadays, they say, I don't believe a preacher, preacher ought to holler and scream. The only problem with people that talk like that is they're ignorant. Amen. I mean, they're probably nice and sweet, they're just dumb. Ain't got no sense. They, you know what Abraham Lincoln said? Abraham Lincoln said, when I hear a preacher preach, I want to hear a man preach like he's fighting these. What well, Abraham Lincoln? Abraham, you mean you don't go to New Manor? Oh, you're behind time. You're out of it. You're just not with it. You don't go to our church. I'm telling you, brother, that's what made America. Don't worry a bunch of dummies that don't know what they're talking about mess you up. But you know what? America didn't listen to Billy Sunday as a whole. And even though he rocked the nation towards God, he fought the liquor traffic to the nail. Man, they'd bust them up, take axes, bust up steels, bootleggers would make it. I tell you, boy, they meant business. Them old boys, old Billy Sunday said, I'm going to preach against the liquor traffic till I die, and when I die, I want my wife to take my skin and stretch it over barrels and make drums out of it and go down the street beating them against the liquor traffic. And I want you to know, America wouldn't listen. She still wanted to booze it up and prosper. In the 20s, and in 1929, something happened that changed this nation. They come over the news and the stock market has just crashed. And they said there's people almost standing in lines on them skyscrapers wanting to jump off and commit suicide. Our economy, and we had what they call the Great Depression. There's people right here in this church this morning that lived during that time, and I feel so helpless to try to tell you about it because I wasn't there. But you know all these stories that Grandma and Grandpa tell your kids about walking barefooted in the snow and seeing the snow blow through the cracks in the walls. That's, that's the truth. But our generation back in the 30s, they had it rough. We don't know what it is to suffer, but they had it rough. In 1933, President Roosevelt began a new deal to try to end the Depression, and finally they brought the economy back up on its feet. 1939, World War II broke out and began. In 1941 to 45, the USA fought in World War II and ended it in 1945 by dropping the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. And somebody said, oh, war is horrible. War is terrible! And they said when World War II was over, somebody told me this since I've been saved. Listen carefully. They said the streets of Marion, that there were people down on their knees on Main Street in Marion thanking God that the war was over. We was at the 4th of July parade the other day. Some boys up there giving out tracts and stuff. I didn't see anybody down on their knees thanking God. If you'd have got down on your knees up there Thursday and thank God, 
they'd have laughed at you and somebody said you need to be put in jail. And yet they said when our boys come home that the people in man on their knees thanking God the war was over. In 1950 the Korean War broke out and for three years another bloody ordeal took place and the war was over. I was born. I don't know what it's like to live in a world. We had that little Vietnam squirmish that drug out for 15 years, but that wasn't a war. That was some, I don't know what that was. It was mighty expensive, whatever it was. I don't really know if you'd call it wars when you fight. And I know some of our boys fought and bled, but I don't know what happened, and I don't try to know, but I tell you what, brother, the 50s began another big boom. God brought America to her knees in 1929 and she repented not and went back on God and so prosperity come again. And in the 1950s started the greatest period of prosperity the world ever seen. The Vietnam War was being off, as I said. Plenty of money, plenty of spare time, a lot of vacation. It got to where everybody on the block owned a car. It got to where almost every home had a telephone. Some of them two, some of them three, some of them two and three cars. Got to where people had money in the bank and could take vacations. People think now that, oh, I'll just die if I have to give up my vacation. Man, people a hundred years ago didn't know what a vacation was. They worked sun up to sundown 52 weeks a year. They didn't know what it was like to miss a day's work. In 19, early 60s, 1962, matter of fact, 63 along in there, our United States decided we can get along without God. We don't need God no more. And our Congress voted, our, our leaders voted to officially kick God and the Bible out of our public school system. And they said, no more will the Bible be read in American schools. No more will you offer voluntary prayer in American schools. It's a gift the law! And that's what they're still fighting over this morning. Madeline Mary O'Hara, one demon-empowered atheist, changed the course of this whole country when she found her son had been praying at school or had been quiet while the other kids were praying, and she said, I'll put a stop to that, and she did. And in the six, listen what happened after they kicked God out, folks. Are you listening to me? In 1962, right on in there, right after they kicked God and the Bible out of our schools, six months later, the nation was crying over a dead president with a bullet in his head out in Dallas, Texas. The very next year, four mop-headed boys come over here from Liverpool, call themselves the Beatles. And from that day to this, America has never, ever been the same. When the Beatles came to America, America changed, and our kids, our homes, our families, our schools, our churches have never been what they were before. Amen, I remember sitting down as an 11-year-old child in front of our old black and white television that you couldn't hardly see the picture on. And somebody said, they're going to be on. We sat down on Sunday night, stiff neck come out. He come out, he said, here they are, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles. He come out like that, and boy, he come out like that, and boy, the crowd, there's the curtain opened up, and there they were, and they said, I said, oh, you, yeah, yeah, this looks like that, boy, and everybody went, hey, yeah. And I sat there, and I watched them. And I'd never loved music that much up until that time, and something about them four boys grabbed me. The girls began to pull their hair out and worship them. After that came the Rolling Stones, the bugs, the snakes, the imps, the vipers. The... I'm not exaggerating, brother. I got one like that now. The drug culture came in. Jack Joplin started singing, shooting dope in her arms. Jimi Hendrix started playing. And they were talking about drinking and partying or you puke. And the whole American scene came, and that's where the term generation gap came in. It, the devil took drove a wedge in between the old and the young. He knew, he knew, he knew if he's ever going to send a generation to hell, he's going to have to alienate the young people from the God and the, the God of their fathers and the Bible and the church. 
So he drove a wagon in there, and he pulled them apart. And they said, I hate your music. And they said, we hate your music. Got our music. We got our lifestyle. We've got our hot rods. We've got our hairstyle. We'll do what we want to do. As I was a teenager coming up, that's the era that I grew up in. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't realize the power that I was fooling with. You say, Brother Danny, how do you know that's true? Because during this time, murder, robbery, rape, all crimes soared, triple, quadruple, five and six hundred percent. People being murdered, people being raped, people being killed and shot. Sociologists said they blamed poverty, mental illness, and a feeling of hopelessness and alienation. We knew exactly what to blame. In 1969, Armstrong, Neil, astronaut Neil Armstrong, stepped out of that capsule and stepped the first step man had ever put on the moon. And he got up there. Somebody said they sent the wrong Armstrong to the moon. I ought to give that other guy one-way ticket. I tell, I tell you what, brother, old Armstrong went up there, and he stepped up there, and he got on the moon, and he said, what did he say? One small step. You remember, how many of you saw that on television when that was on? One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The moon in the Bible is the type of the church. That was a picture of the world stepping on the church and said, we got our own music. We got our own more. We don't want the house of God no more. We're tired of your commandments. We're tired of thou shalt not. We'll do as we please. Let me tell you here this morning, folks, God will let you do as you please. God will let you do wrong. God will let you break the commandments. But there's a price to pay. There's a horrible, terrible price to pay. You'll pay as an individual and we'll pay it as a nation. And we forsake God. Let me tell you something this morning. Dummies, if you're here this morning and you don't think God will punish you, you're a dummy. You break God's law, you pay through the nose. You mark them. It's not if, it's when. Punishment's coming. In 1974, President Nixon became the per first president of our nation to ever resign. Quit. In 1969, the Satanic Church, same year they stepped on the moon, 69. That same spirit, you know, that they talk about in Hotel California. The spirit 69. Reports came in that churches were being vandalized and burned. Blood was dripped on the altars in the house of God. People began to hate and forget God. They began to go to the lake, the mountains on Sunday, lay in the bed on the Lord's day. Right now, while I'm standing here preaching to y'all, there's thousands of people in McDowell County in the bed. They stayed up so late last night and they're watching music television and smoking pot and drinking beer that they can't even get out of bed this morning. Please, have them quiet now. Be quiet. I'm going to finish up in just a moment. No, no talking, no moving around. I'll tell you something, friends. You don't forget God and get by with it. It got worse. They wouldn't allow crosses to be put up in some of our cities at Christmas time. In Boulder, Colorado, a teacher was told not to use the word Christmas when inviting the kids to a Christmas party. They said, don't use that word. It's unconstitutional. Use the word winter holiday. In Florida, a principal ordered the picture of an old Bible club cut out of the yearbook. We don't want God. We don't want the Bible. You say, well, Brother Danny, it is unconstitutional. You're out of your mind. Amen. If it wasn't for this Bible, there wouldn't even be a constitution. Amen. Let me tell you this morning, the constitution was not made for freedom from religion. It was made for freedom of religion. They interpret it now. Our crooked lawyers these days can twist it around and make it sound like freedom from religion. That wasn't the purpose of it. They tell the kids now they can't even pray before a ball game in many of our high schools. It's heartbreaking. 
Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave? What's happened to us, folks? Have we been brainwashed by this society we're living in? You say, oh, we're making progress. Oh, really? We've let communists infiltrate our colleges. People burn draft cards and not even go be punished for it. Rock singers destroy our morals and rob our kids of their decency, their virginity. We became a nation of killer humanists with a plan for a global 2000, for a new world in, in, in the year 2000. Little kids are being tortured and mutilated and offered to the devil by sacrifices. I've got pictures back there in my office of that book where I've got it somewhere. And it's got pictures of little kids that have been burned by their own mama and own stepmamas and daddies. They've got, they got kids who, who, who've been, got cigarette burns all over them right here around McDowell County where people just took a cigarette and held it on to a little old six-month-old baby and burned places all over its body. They've got them been, been raped when they're six and eight months old right around here in this town, right here in McDowell County. What's happened to us, folks? What's happened to us? You remember what I read to you a while ago? The Lord said, if thou turn and don't obey me, all these curses will come upon you. Is it any wonder why the peach crop freezes in Florida and the strawberries get burned out and the apple crops are not destroyed and locusts eat our crops and fires are burning California and Florida and all these things are happening? It's God trying to speak to us. Why are you going to our knees once again? But instead of listening, people will pack the boat behind the camper and boy, they take off to the lake and ride around all day and lay around in nudity and drink beer and suck on a cigarette and lay there like they got a car in the world. Shape our nation's in. You say, well, it's safe now. It used to when the pilgrims was here. They couldn't let their kids go out because a tiger or a rattlesnake might shot right. Bear might get them. Them kids back in them days in them little settlement to start today. Go and look at pictures in, in papers of a little wagon over here on the side of the road and it's all bent up and toys laying on the road broken with their heads off and blood, a pile of blood on the highway where a drunken driver coming and slaughtered a little child. They didn't have to worry about that back in the older settlement days. More dangerous now than it was then. Well, it's heartbreaking heartbreaking. Now here we are in 1905. What's going to happen, preacher? I'll tell you this and I'm going to hush. I appreciate your patience. Here's what's going to happen. If America don't repent, here's what's going to happen. Now be sure you got that. If America don't repent. And brethren, I tell you, it doesn't look like she's going to. I hope I've got faith in God, but I ain't, I ain't done. And it doesn't look like nothing's going to bring this country to an end. I hope it does. I pray it does. But if America don't repent, here's the future. Are you listening? In a short while, there'll be a big blast. Millions of people will go up into heaven, and that'll be the rapture. There'll be a man come out on the scene. He's going to organize a one-world government system and a one-world monetary system, and everybody's money's going to look just like they've already made it. And Xerox, Xerox, the company Xerox has a multi-million dollar contract right now to print the new money. They're going to change your dollar bills for the new money with a metallic thread through the middle of it so it can't be counterfeited. And what that's doing, that's setting the stage for a one world government and the Antichrist, the devil in the flesh, is going to run the world. God said, oh, you don't want it my way? Do it your way! You know what happens then? He causes all to have a mark on the right hand and the forehead. And the Bible said if a man takes that mark on his hand or his forehead, he'll drink the wine of the wrath of God. And right here in the United States, one of these days, the water is going to turn to blood. The American dream will become the American nightmare. And nuclear blasts will go off. And that great big mushroom smoke and people's flesh will be blasted off of their skin, off their, their skin off of their body. They'll be sitting there with just muscles and no eyeballs prophesied in the book of Zechariah. 
and fun will be standing there and people will begin to scream and begin to holler. And you say, well, to get right in? No. The Spirit of God's done withdrawn from the land and the Bible said they'll raise their fist up to heaven and cuss God and curse God because you have power over the plagues. And the Bible said in Revelation chapter 16, let me just tell you what's going to happen and I'll close this morning. Here's what's going to happen to American Dream. It's going to become when the first angel pulls out his vow, there'll be sores break out on people. People still start getting sores all over their body and they'll have old pus and junk running out of those sores and they'll cry and gnaw their tongues for the pain. The second angel pulls vow and it became his blood of a dead man in the seas. The ocean will become his blood. The third angel comes out in the fountains, the fresh water. You'll go to your spigot and turn the water spigot and blood will come out of the spigot. You'll take a shower and turn on the shower and blood will come out of the shower. You say, oh, I don't need that preacher. You've been brainwashed so long, you don't believe the Bible. That's exactly what God said would happen in the word of God. And the fourth angel comes out and brother, the sun turns up its heat. You talk about getting a suntan, brother. If a sun will scorch people with fire, it'll scorch you. It'll burn you. And then the fifth angel poured out his and people, uh, ever gets real pitch black dark and there's a great power failure and nobody can see a hand in front of you. God blacks out the heaven and makes the electricity fail and blows out the lantern and you get blackness and they curse God because of their pain. The sixth angel comes out and the Euphrates River bends to dry up to make a big valley prepared for the battle of Armageddon. And then and the seventh angel poured out his vial. Brother, there was thunders and lightning and a, and a great earthquake. And the Bible said there was a hailstone about the weight of a talent. And his great big hailstone, God gave us a little taste of it just a few weeks ago during the tent revival. But he said during this time they'll be as big as that pulpit. They'll, they'll be weighing 90 and 100 pounds each, up to 125 pounds, and fall all over the land. And people will curse God and say, God's God, a uh, mean God. He's a hateful God. He's not a loving God. He wouldn't let this happen. Listen to me. Right now, God is loving you. Right now, God's giving me to come to this honor. Right now, God's extending his mercy to you. But if you go and live the way you want to live, God's mercy will turn your life will punish you. You mark her down, brother, if, we, if they don't repent. If we don't repent as a nation, the American dream of mama and daddy and church and the Bible is going to be an American nightmare. And you'll be dreaming a dream and living the nightmare. God help us. You say, Brother Danny, here I am, just a, one person. What can I do? Everybody in here can start by being what you're supposed to be. Amen. Well, we can't change the United States, brother. I didn't say you could, but you can let God change you. And that's how it's got to start. Will you do it? Let's bow our heads. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I appreciate your patience this morning. We're not going to keep you long. I feel like the Lord gave me this message. I brought you from the history of our country on up past where we are now and on into the future. I want to ask you a question. If you're trusting in Ronald Reagan to help you, forget it. If you're trusting in the government, I thank God for our government. I thank God for our president. But they are not the answer. Turning back to God with all your heart is the answer. Somebody in here is not saved. If the Lord come right now, somebody in here will be left behind, sure as we live. Somebody in here is not saved. Some Christian in here is not living right. And boy, you sure picked a good time to get out of God's will. Right here at the end, before Jesus. What a fool you'll be. God help you this morning to make things right. We're going to pray. We're going to stand and give an invitation. I believe we'll just let you pray there just a minute instead of standing. God spoke to your heart this morning. You say, Brother Danny, I realize I see where our nation's headed. I ain't even been trying to stop it. I've just been going right along with it. This morning I'm going to come to that altar and get my life in line with God and His Word. And I'm going to make it public. Won't you just get up out of your seat and come to the altar right now? Will you? Just get up out of your seat and come right now. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, Christians are praying. God's dealing with your heart and you need to come and be saved. 
If you're a Christian, you need to come right with the Lord. Do your part. Just get up out of your seat and come right now. Somebody else? Others? Others may need to come. We're just going to a few minutes, then we're going to let you go. You've been playing games? Been playing games? You've been just acting like a Christian? Come on, young man, young lady. Just get up out of your seat and come right now. Come on. Come on, just get up out of your seat and come. Right now. Will you do it? What's happened to the American dream? What's happened to us? What's happened to us? Christians pray. We'll wait just a few seconds. God help us. What if our forefathers could come back and see people walking around with orange hair and clothes pins in their nose, staggering on our streets, laying in our parks, passed out drunk, abortion clinics, murdering babies every morning. God, what's happened to us? Don't have a conscience? Time to get right with God. Time to get right with God. It's got to start with churches just like this. But what they won't listen until the church listens. Somebody else? Maybe you need to confess sin. Come on up here and get it clean. Come on up here and get it confessed and get it right. Don't say, oh no, why'd I do it? Why'd I do it? Why'd I do it? You can't go back and undo it now. Come and get it confessed. Come and get it right with God. Get it cleansed in the blood. That's the only hope. That's the only hope. It's just like Ketsu vine. It'll take over. Ruin your life. What's our kids going to have to grow up in? Moms and daddies don't hit their knees. We're going to pray just a few seconds and we'll let you go. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Just get up out of your seat. If you need to get saved, come on. Get it settled this morning. While she plays softly, we're going to pray. Our Heavenly Father this morning. God, I thank you that you let me be born right in the middle of the greatest section of the world. God, I pray you'll forgive us for not doing better. God, forgive us for being spoiled and not taking advantage of the goodness of God. Lord, we pray right now that you'd forgive us. Forgive me. Forgive our church. I and my people have sinned. We ask you, Lord, that you bless every person here today. I've made this message burn in someone's heart all afternoon. God, I pray you'd reach down this morning and touch some young man in this church. Maybe call him to preach. Call him to be a missionary. Do a great work for you. God, I pray that the word of God will burn in these young preachers' hearts. God, that we may meet back tonight and preach with power. None of the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord, we know that old time preaching and praying is the only hope for our nation. Please, Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to keep our eyes off of the things of this world. Not look left hand or to the right, but straight ahead to Jesus. Whatever and however you do for us, we'll thank you and praise you. I pray for that one that's struggling back there this morning with sin. and The things I said this morning, some of it hit them like a knife. And God, they don't know what to do. They think there's no hope. Please, Lord, let them realize there is hope. And let them realize there's cleanness, there's forgiveness, there's power in the blood of Jesus. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.